audience, so a warm welcome to you all. And we encourage you to be part of the conversation by writing your questions on the chat box or raise your hand. And our guests will be more than happy to uh, answer all the questions that you might have for all of us today. So we will begin with a synthesis, a synthesis of research findings produced under the Workstream Enterprise Development for Job Creation and uh, Growth. This is by John Rand, Professor of Development Economics at the University of Copenhagen, and Carol Newman. She is a professor at, of economics at the Department of, um, of Economics at Trinity College in Dublin. So over to you, John and Carol, for the synthesis research. Thank you so, so much, Ms. Uh, I will just share some slides. Uh, hopefully you can all see them. Good. Mm. So. Thank you so much. Uh, as uh, Monsieur mentioned, we are going to talk about enterprise de uh, development for job creation and growth. So this is Workstream 1 in uh, the overall SA type project. So uh, this is the homepage that Monsieur uh, referred to, where you can find all the details about what we are talking about today. So Workstream 1 is enterprise development for job creation and growth. So we acknowledge basically in this uh, Workstream uh, the dynamics and productive uh, enterprises that they are very essential for some of the key challenges that South Africa is facing. And that is widespread unemployment and inadequate, inadequate economic growth. So basically what we are trying to do in Workstream 1 is to understand the opportunities and constraints to private sector development and productivity growth and how best we can design effective policies to address these constraints and opportunities. So we are basically trying to get a deeper understanding of the functioning of the private sector in South Africa and the mechanisms through which government policies can affect productivity and job creation. So the overall objectives, so more specifically, is to update and expand tax administrative data that we got access to and researchers got access to via SARS and basically made, make this available in a consolidated form to researchers. Moreover, we try to engage and support policy relevant academic research using these data sources. So basically we go back and forth, uh, forth uh, with researchers providing inputs to what is going on. Moreover, we are also communicating the findings of the research to all stakeholders, including the academic community via publications, but also presentations at conferences, but also to policymakers and civil society. And then, in my view, one of the more important uh, components of the project is uh, that we build capacity within South Africa in both managing and using these large scale data sets. So this has, I, I cannot remember how many has gone through this program, but a lot of researchers have, uh, and young researchers are starting to use this uh, key resource. So what have we specifically done under WorldStream 1? We have done quite a number of research papers and it's uh, over 40 researchers that have been involved in this uh, production of papers. So we have more than 20 published research papers under this work stream, and we have around 10 that is ongoing and forthcoming. We also produce policy and research briefs. So basically we are trying to translate some of the deeper knowledge that we gain from the research papers into briefs that are more easily read uh, uh, by the public. And here we have created uh, briefs that basically discuss topics like this, how can we create efficient youth labor policies? Also, can FDI help improve economic complexity? We have actually found, I will come back to that, that uh, the economic complexity was a big surprise that it was not more developed in the South African case. And how to identify and reduce tax avoidance, so a totally different uh, uh, 
uh, topic, you might say. And finally, as Ms. Yudo also mentioned that we are going to discuss today, can South African firms actually compete with Chinese imports? And if so, how should they go about this? And of course, many more, this is just examples. And as I mentioned, the capacity building is basically, we built the data lab together with National Treasury and uh, made support staff available to researchers. There was a research assistance scheme, a young scholars program, and we also supported PhD scholarships. So a lot of capacity building, but also a lot of dissemination acti activities under this work stream. And today, we, as you can see, this is part of the communication and policy bridging that is going to have been taking place throughout the project and will continue hopefully in the future as well. I will not have time today to go through all of the things, but we have some key topics that we would like to go through. But basically under this work stream, you can divide all the work and papers into four thematic soft clusters. And that is productivity and innovation, multinationals, international trade and export performance, temporary and youth employment, and energy costs. Today, I will only have time to briefly just mention some of the results from the productivity and innovation and multinationals, international trade and export performance clusters. Starting with productivity and innovation. What we found uh, very interesting is that there is a significant catch up potential. So a positive result here. Investment in R&D research and development has very, very high returns also in international comparisons. And research and development posit positively affects both long run productivity and employment growth at a pace that is quicker than we see in international terms. The concern here we found in the literature is, or in the research, is that uptake of existing schemes, incentive schemes to do research and development is very, very low. So there is a clear policy message here that we need to improve governance and accessibility of incentives through establishing new sector specific initiatives that stand out as complementary policy measures to go along with already in existing schemes and investment in R&D. We also found a concerning element of the industry connectedness, you might say. We've actually found that inter-industry learning spillovers are fairly limited in an international comparison, given the complexity structure of the South African economy. And moreover, we've actually found very limited acclimation effects, especially within manufacturing. So what is needed is more knowledge about the interconnectedness between sectors, so what we call economic complexity. And we need to understand that better, and it needs to be reflected better in sector-specific policy initiatives. This element is what I call that we need to more coordination of policies within South Africa. And finally, the skills deficit is clearly limiting the spillover potential. So continued support for firm level training initiatives is clearly needed, and that is shown in most of the papers. We also found in other types of research that there is a massive misallocation of capital resources in South Africa. That is, may not be a big surprise, but this is something that needs to be looked into, the misallocation of finance in finance provision. Moving to multinationals, international trade and export performance. There is some re a very interesting research that shows that total tax loss due to profit shifting by more than 80% is happening in South Africa. And the 10 largest company or the 10% largest firms account for 98% of the total estimated tax loss in South Africa. So there is a clear need to focus on these firms in terms of tax avoidance. There is a paper that shows in this work stream that there is an easy build system that flags firms that diverge from so-called arm's length pricing that could be established in this South African case that has been successful in other sectors. And finally, globalization and fragmented production networks have led to a substitution of intermediate inputs produced onshore with imports. <clears throat> So the traditional offshoring is not happening so much in South Africa as we see in other similar countries. 
This has led to a too early, you might say, deindustrialization process, and especially Chinese import penetrations is found to be highly negatively associated with both employment growth, sales growth, and firm survival rates. I know Antonio uh, is uh, he's, uh, one of the main authors uh, behind this uh, result, so we will probably discuss this more thoroughly in uh, just a minute. What we also saw is accumulation of new capabilities and innovation is also essential for export-led growth strategies. The presence of lead firms with superior technology and knowledge can induce spillover effects that increase the productive knowledge of domestic uh, manufacturing firms. So FDI can be used to upgrade the com needed complexity that we just saw in the previous slide that is needed in the South African case. So if the opening up for FDI in the right way may be very beneficial in the South African case. And finally, weak manufacturing export response. Uh, we saw a, a weak manufacturing export response to the 2010 and 14 depreciation. So basically just summarizing what is here on the slide is that the depreciation depreciation tool in terms of exchange rate policies is not uh, very expensive in the South African case. And that is uh, something that we can discuss further in uh, just a minute. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, John, for that presentation. I think before I open it to the audience and to our other guests who have joined us this afternoon or this morning, rather, um, maybe we could talk about the three or four principles, principal lessons from the SA Tide Enterprise Development for Job Creation and Growth Workstream. I know Carol has been quite instrumental in this workstream as well. So it'd be great just to get um, just those three or four principal lessons. It's a question that I'd like to ask, especially when we start off the conversation to actually kick it off and just to get uh, um, what, what your, your, the lessons have been so far. Thank you, Mishudu. Um, so I think that the, I think what would be interesting to talk about today is kind of the, the policy lessons from the research that we have conducted. I mean, there's many lessons in terms of the data, many lessons in terms of capacity building, but we just focus on the actual research output um, I think that thinking more about value chains and the uh, how South Africa's uh, position, the, how South Africa's domestic value chain functions and also its position in the global value chain is something that I think we need to give um, a lot of consideration to. So a number of the, the findings from the research um, are pointing towards um, an impo the importance of the input supply sector and the domestic input supply sector. Um, so South African firms, for example, they are not offshoring. Um, South, Af um, South African firms are, you know, um, are not able to compete with Chinese imports, which is some of the work that Antonio has done. So I think that understanding that and thinking through the policy implications of that and what can be done from a policy perspective will be the first thing. Um, I think the second thing relates to the evidence around the research and development initiatives and the fact that um, they do have a very um, big um, effect on productivity, but the uptake is very, very low. Um, so kind of policies around kind of promoting more of these incentives or maybe introducing even new initiatives is also important. And then I think the third one that comes out from the research for me relates to the size distribution of firms and the extent to which the small firms are there needs to be a focus on the small firms and the debate around that, supporting those small firms. So we see that we have evidence that they the capital misallocation that result as, as a result of um, um, at lack of access to finance is an issue. We also find some evidence that, you know, there is maybe a case for supporting training initiatives more so in the smaller firms, which are more likely to um, employ um, on, you know, lower skilled um, youth to address the youth unemployment problem, for example. So I'd say that those are the, the, the three main kind of policy um, discussions, I think, that emerge from the research um, so far. Not sure if you've had, you have anything to add, John, to, to what uh, Carol has said. No, not really. She summarized it very well, as usual. Um, uh, but uh, one thing may be uh, the issue of taxes, uh, a, a lack of taxation of uh, large companies. It's not a, a thing that is uh, specific to South Africa, 
it's a, an international problem, but it's still something that each country needs to be focused on. Uh, and it's something that is basically adding to this misallocation of resources that we have found in the research. So maybe uh, in terms of taxes, we should also have a focus. All right, I'd like to um, introduce our panelists this morning. We've got Antonio Andrioni, an Associate Professor of Industrial Economics at the U uh, University College of London and Head of Research of the UCLE Institute for Innovation and uh, Public Purpose, and Tanya van Melis, the Acting DDG of the Competition Policy and Economic Policy Branch at the DTIC. She also serves as a part-time commissioner on I take a very good afternoon or oh, good morning rather to our panelists joining us this morning. So I'd like to give you an opportunity. Uh, thank you so much for joining us just to give your reflections on the synthesis of research that John has presented. I'll give uh, Tanya the opportunity and then um, Antonio can then just give us a few um, words and all maybe just give us a comment on what he thought of the synthesis research. Thank you. Thanks very much, Mashudu. I think the research in the initiative is absolutely fantastic and certainly is of use to policymakers. It helps us shift the question from can South African firms survive imports, imports from China or any other low cost imports to what can we do to survive? And you point us to some very useful tools. So for example, promoting more R&D, promoting more training, so just, just as a start, I think that's absolutely useful. It'll also help in the discussion to be able to locate your policy measures within the broader policy measures that are offered so that we make sure that we've got a coherent approach and a coordinated approach. Okay, I think I can uh, follow up on Tanya then. Um, well, first of all, thanks for the, thanks for the invitation. And uh, I think, there are a few issues here that um, emerge quite clearly. First of all, the complexity of the issues we are talking about. Uh, there is a huge amount of heterogeneity across not just firms, but firms in different sector and sector of value chain. So in some, in some respect, these studies have been trying to capture that. There are always limitations in whatever approach and methods are used, but I think it's important to make use as much as possible of this micro data. Um, acknowledging the limitation and the complementary type of work that has to be done to understand really the context and the structure of this context. The second element that I would raise, apart from this uh, significant heterogeneity, which also means that uh, results are very skewed towards certain sectors, activities, behaviors in terms of R&D or uh, concentration of technological capabilities, we can go back to that later. The second point I would like to raise is also that things are evolving quite uh, in a quite fast way, um, in the sense that, for example, if we talk about import penetration, uh, the nature of import penetration has been changing dramatically. Um, and you know, if we are uh, used to the idea of cheap import penetration from China, where uh, capacity at production at scale is, is of course, uh, uh, a, a key competitive advantage, uh, we are moving towards more uh, medium high tech type of competition, which means that for a country like South Africa, which has a number of segments of medium high tech, uh, for example, in the context of uh, mining equipment or other mechanical and machinery type of sectors, I think it's an important uh, 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 ring bell for the government in thinking about how to uh, keep uh, upgrading the policies so that they respond to an evolving scenario. And the third point I would raise is that um, lots of the phenomena that we observe in terms of the structuring of the domestic value chain in their link with the global value chain, even the tax dimension that was raised, it's really about the power structure within this, this uh, uh, relationship uh, between companies. And I think uh, Tanya will talk more about that eventually later. Uh, when I talk about power structure, I mean the capacity to capture uh, value along these value chains. And as a result of that, uh, being or not able to make investment that are needed, the type of points that John was raising at the right point in the chain, uh, but also uh, being able to uh, sustain a relationship between small, medium, 
and uh, uh, large, larger system integrators in, in these different sectors. And I think here what is paradoxical, and we are more referring to other research we've been doing with the, the DTI over the last three years uh, with also the Industrial Development Think Tank, which is hosted by the Center for Competition, Regulation, Economic Development and the Sarchi Chair at University of Johannesburg, is that in South Africa, differently from other countries, you have quite a lot of small medium enterprises with uh, extremely sophisticated medium high tech and uh, sometimes high tech uh, uh, technologies and capabilities. So these are all opportunities that can be captured if these power dimensions and concentration of power, especially in the backward industries are addressed uh, directly. So I would say uh, there is an opportunity here to think about not simply more uh, horizontal or functional policies, but also more traditional vertical industrial policies to unlock these, these opportunities. Thank you very much, Antonio. To our audience members, we encourage you to be part of the conversation. So do write your questions in the chat box and I'll be able to pose them uh, to our guests and panelists uh, this uh, morning. So if you also would like, you can also raise your hand and we will be more than happy. So I think what we can do now, Antonio, is to continue having that chat about the global value chains. And to what extent do South African firms integrate into the global value chains and the implications of investment and skills? Sure, I'll try to be brief. I think the first dimension here to, uh, that I already raised is really what value chains we are talking about, right? So. We know that there are a number of sectors where South Africa traditionally in the post-apartheid period has started increasingly integrating. Um, for example, if we already mentioned the mining equipment, when we can talk about, of course, the automotive sector would be a key other example. But also we see an increasing uh, interesting dynamic, for example, in the uh, citrus industry and other uh, uh, high value uh, uh, agricultural commodities and products that are exported internationally to, to the markets. We're talking about blueberries and other types of things. So there are a number of value chains that have been building up. The issue is how these value chains have been integrating both uh, in the global markets and in the backward in the domestic markets. Now, if we think about the first layer in this uh, uh, dynamic, if we think about the period of 2010-17, which was the one we focused our attention on given the type of data, micro data that we had, you can see that uh, uh, South Africa has been, of course, uh, 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 mainly integrating in terms of final products towards the regional markets where it still has an important uh, uh, role to play, but also has been increasing uh, integrating with the Chinese economy. China is the main trading partner, both in terms of uh, the, the exposure in particular to, to, to import, which has dramatically increased. And as I said, has increased in areas which we're not expecting in the past. Now, this, this effect, uh, what we managed to estimate is the extent to which this integration into the value chain, in particular the Chinese manufacturing value chain, uh, has had an impact on employment growth, on uh, the, uh, if you want, the chances of firms to survive competition over time, so the survival rate, and also uh, what is happening in terms of uh, their uh, strategies for investment in, in other sectors and activities. And here you see clearly that there is a, a strong divide. And I think this is important to highlight. The problem is not so much that China is becoming more competitive. The problem is that companies are not responding adequately to that type of competition and pressure. So we try to uh, estimate what is the impact of import competition, distinguishing firms that have been showing uh, signs of uh, a, a proactive or reactive strategy. So investment in skills, paying royalties, investing in machinery, and so on and so forth. And you see that immediately these companies have been actually able to sustain competition. So the competition is a problem to the extent that domestically uh, there is lack of investment. If domestically there is investment, GDC can offer important uh, new markets, uh, uh, access pathways and opportunities. What is worrying, and I think this is something that we can come back later, is that very few companies enter into this category. So very few companies have been actually reacting and investing, which means that at the systemic level, you see that the final outcome is at the industrialization. There are not enough companies to respond to that type of import competition. 
that are doing the right type of things. And also, the fact that there are a number of companies not responding also means that you have effect in the domestic value chain. So we distinguish between a direct effect of import competition with an indirect one. What do we mean here? Basically, all the time you have a company which is going to be affected in their specific products or activities at their stage of the value chain by import competition, it's not that simply that company will produce less or employs less people or be, generate less value addition taxes and so on. It's also that it will, uh, it will start demanding less from their suppliers. And so the, there is going to be an indirect effect of the supply chain, which means suppliers leave of the, their food is what they can sell to the other companies along the value chain. If they cannot do that, also they will start shrinking themselves. So this indirect effect, it's, it's very important because this is the opposite of what we'd like to see. We would like to see increasing development of local production systems strongly integrated into the global markets. And actually we see that exactly because we lack the type of firms that they can make this happening, uh, or in general I'm talking now, uh, we have as an outcome of premature the industrialization, lack of employment opportunities, and so on and so forth. Um, maybe we can go back to the causes of that in the discussion as well. You, you can go ahead, Tanya. Do you want to add something? Yeah, I'd love to. I wasn't sure if um, I should raise a hand. Or... <laughs> Thanks very much. I mean, I think what Antonio is saying is fascinating, and I agree very much with what he's saying. I just want to point to two areas in terms of a policy response where we're trying to stimulate the growth of local industries and the development of value chains and into international value chains. One thing that we had seen in the past was that companies often try to use tariffs as a form of protection. And it became quite blunt because with that protection, we had eased off on the pressure for the companies to become competitive at the same time. So it wasn't a long-term solution. What we're doing now through our tech is that when companies apply for uh, tariffs or rebates or even uh, safeguard duties as an example, we're asking for reciprocal commitments on increased investment in production, increased R&D, increased training on skills, so that at least we're still stimulating what should make those companies more competitive and from what Antonio was saying, more resilient. Another area that we've been trying to do that as well is through competition policy. So FDR has the potential to grow production, to grow jobs. What we've done with FDR coming into the country is also to put in some public interest considerations where companies agree to invest further in production, R&D, stimulate local production. Thanks. I see John also taking a lot of notes, uh, uh, writing away. Is there something that you would like to add to the question that I posed a little earlier? Yeah, I, 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 especially this, uh, the Tanya just said, uh, the making the tariff reductions that the uh, firms can apply for dependent on the investments. Mm -hmm. um, I don't think, uh, Carol, you may correct me here. I don't think in the research, it should be possible to actually test this uh, in the, with the data that we have, uh, the kind of effect that these uh, tariff reductions have had on investments of the firms that engage in the global value chain. So basically extending on the research that you have done, Antonio, I don't know if you have done anything. So it should actually be possible to test this specific idea the, or policy that you just mentioned, Tanya, with the data we have at hand. So if there are some PhD students listening here, I clearly think there is, there is a, a, a topic here or a, a, a project that can be pursued uh, going forward that would be a benefit a benefit for both research and for policy. I could just come in on, on the other point that uh, Tanya raised there about, about FDI and um, kind of having kind of some element of kind of public interest in relation to that. Another finding that I'd be interested uh, to hear your reaction to, another finding from, from the work under this work stream was that um, FDI spillovers, there's not a whole lot of them. 
certainly within, in, within sector, but there do appear to be spillovers from kind of upstream to, to, to downstream. So again, that focus on the input supply sector. And um, I don't know in terms of the, the policy or the strategies that you have in place, whether it's targeting FDI in particular sectors um, is, is a part of that. So where we've been able to attach conditions to FDI has been primarily when there's been a merger. And with that then, there's been an emphasis on increasing localization and through that developing value chains. So I'll give a nice example. Apple Tazer is an iconic South African brand. It's a fizzy fruit drink. The company was bought by Coca-Cola International. And we said, look, it's an iconic brand. We want to make sure that it survives in South Africa and doesn't just get made elsewhere. So what Coca-Cola committed to do was to increase the localization of apples in South Africa that it was using. And in, for grape Tazer, increased uh, localization of grapes. And we were able to set up through the RDC, the Industrial Development Corporation, Coke together with grape farmers. And the farming has actually increased because of that. Coca-Cola had also undertaken to export a lot of the South African made goods into their distribution stream that they're able to, which we couldn't before. So it's worked quite well. If I can comment on that, Mashudo, I think, Tanya, you gave us an excellent example of the type of industrial policy discussion we should have, which is really how to align interest across a number of players where the government can broke lots of these type of relationships to make them working. And I would say my experience, we've done quite a lot of work with DPI as well and Craig on the mining equipment value chain, where again, I think there is huge potential. The data that we got shows that is by far the sector with the higher R&D, the higher type of fixed capital investment and so on. So where, and there is also some agglomeration effect in the, in the Gotenk cluster and so on. Um, the problem is always to find the right type of players and also go beyond pre-established form of industrial policy and focusing on the functions. I mean, we had lots of engagement with stakeholders around how to design local content policy that deliver on the function that we want to have, which is more domestic capabilities and so on, and actually avoid those form of local content policy that in fact might obtain the opposite result because create bottlenecks or constraints that firms cannot comply with. So there is this element of really the, the fine tuning of the, uh, uh, the policy design process and the acknowledgement of the difference in the structure of these value chains to be able to be effective in the policy design. And I think from that point of view, uh, it's, it's incredibly uh, important that the type of work that has been done here is complemented with other type of approaches that allows us to grasp this granularity of uh, the, the specifics uh, of these value chains and relationships. To our audience members, we encourage you to be part of the conversation by writing questions in the chat box. We also, we, we know that you are out there. So please do write uh, your questions in the chat box and be part of the conversation. Tanya, you wanted to, to say something? Mm, absolutely, just pointing to the complexity of policy design, the complexity within sectors and power relations. So I think unless policy is designed or has substantial input from social partners, you're going to get suboptimal policy. You can have the nicest policy in the world, but if social partners are not going to implement it, you're dead in the water. So that essentially means you've got to get a variety of players along the value chain upstream, downstream, sometimes if it has to be related sectors, related sectors. But to then try and say, how can we craft a different way forward? Government's role there is to give a push. I mean, I think part of path dependency is people don't want to change how they think they, you know, manufacturing or how they think they mar uh, market it. If government is able to pull parties together and say, let's now explore firm ideas, but then also where are the co key conflicts between parties within a value chain and how do we resolve those? We're not going to get the kind of industrialization that we look for.
I think we can focus a little bit on the exchange rate and as a topic that Antonio would be able to, to respond to. Um, when you look at, uh, let's talk a bit about the difference between firms within and across the sectoral value change and chains and the ability to absorb the um, changes in the exchange rate. Sure, I'm happy to, to engage with this point. I guess uh, John and Carol have also looked at that. I mean, in our specific project, we try to focus on, um, uh, if you want, the matching of data between the firms, their behavior, and a specific type of commodities at a quite level of disaggregation in the, in the trade pattern. So we try to uh, get to that uh, issue, um, but we do not necessarily look at the direct impact of uh, variation in, in exchange rates. Um, what I would say here is, however, that um, this type of variation has a dramatic impact in terms of um, uh, de determining the price competitiveness of the final product and the intermediate products that eventually South Africa want to export. And they have a very disproportional impact along the value chains. So there are a number of companies who can absorb or transfer the effect of uh, the exchange rate and others that cannot do that. And that is where the disproportionality comes in. Um, there are a number of uh, prices that already are largely disproportionately higher and so affect a lot the, uh, the, the buyers, especially when talking about industrial raw materials that enter along the value chain that are critical to value chain. If we think about steel, for example, in for automotive and specialized steel for uh, uh, mechanical and uh, machinery and uh, mining equipment and so on. And here the problem is not only the, 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 the devaluation or the valuation of certain type of uh, uh, periods, but also how this destabilizes the capacity of businesses to make investment over time. So we, we really need to grasp this fundamental issue. Lots of these medium high tech companies have to commit resources over long cycles of products and technologies and investment. A disruption that comes from an exchange rate uh, uh, devaluation or appreciation means that fundamentally this commitment of resources, which were uh, viable, might become unviable. And this is a, a, a fundamental issue because, um, uh, in a sense, uh, uh, lots of good companies which have capabilities, who have investing skills, can be uh, remain trapped in a situation of this type and be out of business quite easily. So I think the management of exchange rate and understanding our exchange rate can have this type of impact along value chains is critical in uh, integrating more macro and industrial macroeconomic policy and industrial policy making because these two policy areas tend to be often disjoint and uh, we always always we, we tend to realize how they are joined when we see companies <laughs> going down the rail because uh, they were not properly uh, uh, supported in that process and the very last point clearly there is an issue here around, you know, uh, when there is a, a period of devaluation, uh, how this is captured also as an opportunity for uh, actually being more competitive in the international market or how this is simply transferred, right? So variation in exchange rate are variation in rents allocation in prices markups and what, what they mean for companies. If they are absorbed in a rentieristic way, <laughs> uh, this means that we are not going to uh, you know capture the opportunity and you can see this also the other way around right you think about commodity cycles if a commodity cycle is translated into massive increase in investment so retain and reinvest what that commodity boom cycle gives you then you can have further expansion in, the, in these sectors if it is absorbed through forms of uh, rentieristic behavior or financialization then of course this this doesn't result is not sustainable over time absolutely We do have a question coming through from um, Alia Kasim. Um, she's asking, posing this question, there is, it, it, that historically trade policy and competition policy can be contrary to one another, given the amendments to the Competition Act in promoting small players is trade policy moving in a similar direction? That's a, a fantastic question. I think 
trade policy has a focus on international competition. And the challenge is, is that if we provide some support, how are we going to be able to ensure that that support translates into growth? Competition policy's focus is primarily on domestic players and increasingly looking at regional players and international players. But there is a tension between the two. So for example, within the Competition Act, while we sm promote small players and the amendments have a specific focus on small players, one's also one also has to look at the impact of a proposed merger on our ability to compete internationally. I think matters have to be weighed up on a case by case basis. Both competition policy and trade policy want to overall make sure that we develop industrialization in the country, but an industrialization that is competitive. And to that extent, each individual case may have different elements that need to be explored. I'm happy to talk on it further if you want. Can I just, Monsieur, can I just add? I think it's a great question, uh, Alia. Um, and it points to this issue of policy coordination uh, that we are facing in a lot of countries, even my own, where there is a, what do you call it, lack of coordination. Uh, that's uh, may maybe the most positive word that I can find uh, because uh, uh, different politicians have different agendas and uh, they're often not well coordinated. One thing that we have learned from research is that in order to get uh, solid results, we need better coordination. Uh, and it, it refers to it directly to this question as well, because uh, competition policy, there are many papers saying that trade policy and competition policy and even uh, industrial policy cannot be disentangled. It has to be seen as a common, given the internationalization that we are facing, the global value chains what Antonio just been talking about as well, in terms of depreciation rates. Oh, uh, yeah, we cannot distinguish or divide it into separate groups. We need to do a consolidated policy. And I have to be frank, uh, worldwide, not only South Africa, this coordination has not been strong. There's a follow-up from, um from Alia, um, she says it would be useful to hear about examples of how these tensions have been resolved. I can also see Ayanda's hand. So as soon as we've responded to um, Alia's question, we can definitely go through to Ayanda. Thanks. Okay. So, I mean, an interesting case is looking at the metals value chain in South Africa, where we have one large primary up steel, steel, uh, upstream steel manufacturer and then a significant number of small and medium-sized companies downstream. The upstream steel manufacturer has applied for and received protection from ITAC on both tariffs and through trade remedies. And we do that to make sure that we have an industrial base and a steelmaker in the country. It has competition policies for downstream because a lot of the downstream suppliers then say that inputs, their inputs are significantly more expensive or curtailed because they're unable to get the, the specific types of steel that they need in order to manufacture. Now, trade can provide protection for upstream. What we've been trying to do is align trade support for the downstream as well, so that you don't have an imbalance where upstream has got significant support and downstream is left to the cruel winds of competition. At the same time, though, competition policy has tried to address the structure of the metals and engineering sector as a whole. So the large steel producer that I'm talking about has been found for collusive behavior as one example. The initiatives to see how we can try and grow small downstream firms in the sector as well. Supportive trade policy is needed, but we need to be able to crack open the economy with competition policy in order for smaller firms to be able to develop and compete effectively. 
Thank you very much, Tanya. We've got Ayanda Tlatoayo's hand up. Um, you could just ask Ayanda and, and pose your question. Okay, sorry, I was struggling to unmute myself. Um, thanks so much uh, for all the insights. Um, I think I just wanted to to echo a few of the, you know, suggestions that have been posed. Um, firstly, drawing on uh, what John mentioned earlier when Tanya was talking about reciprocal commitments that are tied to tariff protection. I think this is a really important area to explore, especially because I think the issue that we've found with the reciprocal commitments is that they're not legally binding. So firms can choose to comply with them and there really isn't much that we can do from a policy perspective to enforce them to keep those commitments. So I think research in this area would really help because it then gives us an idea of to what extent it actually um, helps us what better ways is it to try and get firms to commit to certain things? So for example, they might do better on employment commitments versus investment commitments. You found that like even with a lot of the um, competition policy findings where, uh, for example, the, the steel producer that Tanya is talking about, they'll have, um, com they'll have fines that they're given, but then when they're not going through favorable times, they can then petition and ask for those fines to be lifted or to delay payment of them. So, you know, I think there's a lot that's been happening in the past few years. And so a lot of companies can't then meet those commitments. And I think that, you know, uh, just trying to understand that a bit more and what we can actually derive from firms through those commitments and better articulating them would take us a long way. Um, I think the second thing that uh, for me is, is really important and, you know, as part as having worked on the data as well, it's just this role that intermediate inputs seem to play for South Africa. Um, and Tanya started to talk about it. I feel like she actually um, covered everything I wanted to go into because I think the 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 value chain, the steel value chain, is a really interesting um, one to look at in South Africa in particular because it highlights so many of the different issues that you actually find for policymakers, um, where I think as much as we've tried to approach industrial policy from a value chains perspective, I don't know how much we've been able to not listen to the loudest voices on the value chain. So for example, as much as we're trying to support everyone, I still think um, to some extent, you get into this issue of still having to, pro to, to protect even the large producers within the value chains, because everyone is interdependent and codependent. Um, and you'll find that, I, I want to put this in a, in a really um, palatable way, but I think that you, you do find that like a lot of the big entrenched companies in South Africa, and this is not just for steel, um, tend to be bullies because you, know, you have these large multinational um, companies um, which aren't sourcing local material. I think. Um, one of the papers in, in this work stream, I think it was Bjorn's paper, showed that, you know, we, we could do more in terms of policy to try and um, get m and to source locally and source more local inputs. But that becomes hard for South Africa when you get so many, even when we protect companies in terms of tariffs, you find that the specifications, um, when you get down to it, there's just such a lack of industrial capacity. So for me, um, when you have low um, production capacity, you have low capacity utilization in these firms, but we're asking them to then change and, and invest more in technologies to help them compete with the inputs that are coming in from China. It becomes a really challenging situation. And you know, I'd, I'd like to get the views of the panelists on what we can do as policymakers to try and get you know, into that, how you balance all of those factors, because it really is hard for a company that is operating at 60% capacity to then change and upgrade all of their machinery um, for demand that might not come. Um, and I think the last thing that I wanted to, uh, well, I think it escapes me now, but oh, actually the, the role um, of, of these small firms, because it's seeming that the smaller firms are actually what we need to focus on if we're going to be able to address the competition issues that we're seeing. In our paper with Lawrence, for example, we found that the, the small companies are actually the ones 
that are the most reactive to the exchange rate movements, which is exactly what we need. And so for me, it's like most of these papers just reinforce that we should be supporting smaller producers a bit more, mm -hmm. um, but in constructive ways um, that help them build capacity, grow, become export exporters become competitive in the export market because sometimes i think with government we then say let's localize production um let's designate these products and let's allow the let's let government provide the demand but you can't have companies that are dependent on government demand um those companies will never then be able to grow and compete in the export market uh i think right. i'll i'll stop there all right, thank you so much, Ayanda. We'll just give the panelists an opportunity to uh, respond to what you've said, thanks. I can start, it's very quick. Uh, I think it was a great comments uh, and I agree. Um, let me just be frank, uh, and that is a, of course a personal opinion. I think uh, what is important in policy making now is basically using this uh, tool that now you mentioned Björn's paper, uh, earlier, but uh, this uh, framework of understanding the whole supply chain linkages in, before doing any policy. Fully understand the picture here, and every policymaker should be taught this before they even uh, start thinking about uh, introducing a policy. I know this is very researcher-like comment, but I actually think it's, uh, it's uh, very important, and I think there is a misunderstanding of these linkages and what uh, happens when you do depreciation policies uh, or allow for depreciation of the currency? How does it uh, run down in the system and so forth? So the, the whole linkage system needs to be better understood in the South African case. That would also maybe lead us to not treat larger scale firms with, uh, or provide them with preferential treatment as we see now. Uh, so I fully agree on Ayanda's uh, points, uh, so thank you for that, but I think it has to start, and I can just uh, say, look into Bjorn's paper on these complexity issues, that's a good start. Maybe I can com come in there. I, I fully agree as well, and I think what Anders' points um, kind of highlight is the, what we talked about earlier, the complexity of policy making and how difficult it is to coordinate not only across trade policy, competition policy, but across sectors and across um, different types of firms. And it comes back to Antonio's point, which he started out with, which is about the heterogeneity that is there. Um, so, so the policy response is, is very, very tricky. But it's true that um, um, I think all of the studies, or almost all of the studies that have looked at the size distribution of firms in the manufacturing sector in particular, has shown that, that, that there's potential there, but they're constrained. They're constrained in terms of perhaps um, um, skills development, they're constrained in terms of access to finance. Um, so I, I guess there are kind of things that can be done from a policy perspective, but it, it really does need to be done in that very coordinated way that, um, that John spoke about. Antonio? Oh, thanks. Yeah, sorry, I got a problem with my internet and now for some reason Zoom was not allowing me to unmute myself. Um, I just would like to say something about you know, this issue of how we frame the problem. I think and this is economy's fault. I think we should stop talking about categories like small, big and so on. I'm, I myself a uh, 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 part of the problem. What I mean is that uh, sometimes these, you know, when we say we should support the small, not the big, and so on, we miss the fundamental interdependence between these players. The problem is how you make the big perform the functions that they have to perform in a productive way along a structure, right? Because heterogeneity is the first step. Then it's how we link that understanding of differences into an understanding of the structure, how these things work together. Each of these different uh, entities. Uh, don't mean anything in themselves, right? Because we don't have you know, vertical integrated activities. We have supply chain, local production systems that have to be uh, shaped uh, by policies that take into account what each of the different uh, players can perform and what are the uh, uh, technical constraints. I think the previous speaker was mentioning, you know, how do you commit to resources when you have, for example, within the automotive sector, you have a market which has been 
uh, going you know, towards the half a million, even less, and how you can make this commitment of investment if the demand is not going to be there or the market is, is, is not sending you the type of signal that you want. And I think here is where really thinking carefully about how the design uh, can change things and can create these interdependencies, right? Mutual conditionalities around what to do. You know, in the case of local content, for example, uh, someone could say, well, we cannot reach local content. This is the typical response that we get for firms because there are not the type of supply that we need in the country, right? If I need to buy the specific type of bulk and it's not reused here, um, you know, how do you want me to you know, get to that local content? Now, the problem is, if that is the case, how can you create the conditions where that company can reach that local content by, for example, uh, and I'm using an expression used by some companies themselves, powering other companies to become exporters, right? How you create more local content by uh, uh, getting things from outside, but at the same time, increasing the amount of export that you're able to generate, right? So this is an example of how you try to create local content policies that include trade policy and include industrial policy into it, with what, which was the point discussed before by, by John. Last point I would like to raise is that Industrial policy is not simply promoting uh, new things or more, might also mean uh, promoting that uh, the, or supporting exit from certain type of activities. There are a number of activities where uh, competing is extremely difficult because there have, there have been uh, capacity built in other countries, in particular in the case of China, in a number of uh, intermediate industrial goods where probably doesn't make sense to try to uh, reproduce that level of scale because the market would not be there. But it would make sense to leverage the engineering capability that exists in the country to actually integrate these products in more complex products that can generate the type of value addition we need. I'm thinking about all the opportunities that digitalization can offer, especially in a country like South Africa where there are engineering capabilities distributed. Just before the meeting, Tanya was mentioning the initiative during the COVID uh, around you know, uh, creating you know, CPAP and other type of ventilators. This could have not happen in any, almost any other African countries, probably Egypt would be the exception, because there are not those engineering capabilities in other countries. In South Africa, there are, and the problem is to get smart policies that leverage them in a selective way, while at the same time address these power imbalances that at the end of the story remains there. And I think South Africa has done lots of important things in this direction, probably where things have been lacking is not just the, the designer element, but is the enforcement part. And the enforcement of these policies, it's a uh, fundamentally political economy problem that uh, hopefully we are uh, uh, addressing more and more uh, with more commitment uh, to, to make, to enforce uh, uh, things that uh, are, are, are promoted by the government. Thank you very much, Antonio. Tanya, I'll give you the last word on this. We do, we have run out of time. It's been quite an amazing uh, conversation that we've had over the past hour. So I'll just give you uh, a few minutes just to wrap up the conversation for us. Sure. The one point that has been risen is how political economy drives policy making as well as economic structure. We have a highly concentrated economic structure in, in the country. And the larger players tend to have access to more resources, more time to be able to try and influence policy. The kind of research that you're doing is critical because it provides policymakers with information about enterprises or subsectors that are not necessarily able to bring their issues to the fore in the same way that the large companies do. And as government, we've got to make sure that we're catering to a range of needs across the economy in the interest of broader national development. So just to reiterate from where we started, this is extremely valuable research, not only because of the information that it provides and the policy options that it provides, but it enters directly into the political economy itself and gives government tools to be engaged, to be able to engage on where they're more vulnerable sectors. The final thing is the point about policy coordination is absolutely well taken. You just have to also move towards not only trying to coordinate policy better, but trying to implement policy better and more quickly, becoming a more entrepreneurial state so that we're able to achieve the developmental results that we want. 
Thank you very much to all our panelists this morning. Thank you so much for making the time and for this engaging conversation that we've had this morning. Antonio Andrioni, we have uh, John Rand, Carol Newman, and Tanya Millis, Van Millis. Thank you so much for this time that you've given us. And a very big a uh, big thank you goes out to our official partners, without whom this would not have been possible. You and you wider, the National Treasury, the South African Revenue Service, the Department of Planning, Monitoring and Evaluation, the Department of Trade, Industry and Competition, uh, Trade and Industry Policy Strategies, the International Food Policy Research Institute, and most of all, the European Union for their continued commitment and invaluable financial support for this very important program. And to you, our audience members, thank you for joining us this morning and being part of our conversation. And do look out for the next policy dialogue. And don't forget to visit the SATID website for more interesting research. Have a lovely day further. Thank you very much. Goodbye.